Hi, my name is Claudette, and I'm part of the engagement department at Grey Roots Museum, and I'm here with my co-worker, Stephanie. Hi, we're here today, and we're going to talk about the log cabin in Morston Heritage Village. This is the first building that most visitors encounter when they start visiting our village, and we're very excited to tell you about it today. Sounds good. Stephanie, the, um, you know, when we talk about the log cabin, we're talking about pioneer days where we're, we're talking about a fairly long time ago. Can you give us a sense of what was happening in that time period and who was here? Was this even Gray County then? What was happening at that time? The log cabin is appointed to 1853, so fairly early in Gray County's settler history, immigrant history. But there certainly was life and activity in what is now Gray County, and there had been for centuries. At the beginning of the 17th century, when uh, explorer Samuel de Champlain came through this area, the Petun, who were Iroquoian peoples and allies of the Huron, lived here. But starting around 1700, Anishinaabe, or Ojibwa people, lived in this area. They made it their home. They had a vibrant social life, a strong economy, uh, relationships with other Indigenous peoples and with non-Indigenous traders. And they were quite content and successful in their lifestyle here. These are some really lovely paintings of at the time, by the way. So originally we had some indigenous folks living here and then who came to Gray County first? It was the Europeans, right? There was an influx of people into Gray County starting in the late 1830s when there started to be any non-indigenous people to any significant degree. And uh, although there were people of various backgrounds, the predominant ones were the Irish. Um, and certainly the Irish in the 1840s had experienced a succession of crop failures of the potato. And so we're coming to North America in enormous numbers. Many of them ended up in Gray County because by the 1840s, Gray County was the last unsettled land as far as non-Indigenous people were concerned. And so they came in great numbers to Gray County. There were also Germans coming and settling, particularly in the southwest part of Gray County around Hanover and Neustadt, as the names imply. And they were from an area of Germany that featured a lot of craftsmen, but industrialization changed the economy. And so many of them emigrated to Canada. Of course, there were Scottish people who were coming as well because the economy of Scotland was changing and they wanted to take advantage of the opportunities that Canada had to offer. As did the English and of course were very familiar in popular culture with the Industrial Revolution and some of the extremes that resulted in English life. And so many English people came to Canada and came to Gray County, again, because in the 1840s, this was an open area of opportunity as far as non-Indigenous people were concerned. There also, interestingly, were a lot of Americans who came. There were white Americans, but significantly there were a lot of black Americans who came and settled in Gray County in its earliest years. Some were free men and who had simply moved to the area to take advantage of the opportunity, but many more had recently escaped slavery in the American South and were looking for both opportunity and liberty here in Gray County. It had to be really overwhelming for them, all these people coming from different countries, different climates, different environments, different cultures to come here to Gray County. That, that just had to have been really overwhelming and really challenging for them. Yes, uh, when you read history backwards, it seems natural that they knew how to cut down trees and build houses and um, all of the things that we associate with pioneer life. But 
really for most of the people who came to settle Gray County, the kinds of forests that they encountered here were like nothing they had ever seen in their lives. Most of them um, had not cut down a tree before. They didn't know how to build a house or a shelter. They had to learn all of these skills very, very quickly, and it was a very daunting task. Moreover, the wildlife that they encountered was also quite different from what they were used to. I bet. And so things like um, wolves and bears were... Encounters were relatively rare, but it was something that was so foreign to them that there's a whole genre of literature about wolf and bear attacks during pioneer times. And settlers were all terrified that something would happen when they encountered these animals. And of course, as we said at the outset, this land isn't empty. It's not like there is no one here and it's just waiting for settlers to come. There are already people here who are living their lives and they're happy to live the lives that they have practiced. And so there is, um, there's relationships and there's uh, tension between different cultures because perception of land use, um, language barriers. So there is those challenges as well for the settlers. Now, they all came from all over the place, really, uh, even traveling, you know, that that's not a thing that we're really used to today, though, the means by which they had to travel uh, in the 1800s. Yes, it's, it's true. Uh, Gray County in particular is quite isolated, relatively speaking, during the 1840s and 1850s. There is no train service to Gray County until the 1870s, and even then it's narrow gauge, which is not the common um, usage for trains. To get to Gray County, uh, typically you either travel by water, you can either take a schooner such as the Eliza White, which was launched in 1852 and connected from Toronto to Owen Sound through the Great Lakes, going through Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, up Lake Huron, around the Bruce Peninsula, and then down to Owen Sound. You could also take a ferry from Aurelia and then take the ship across the southern part of Georgian Bay to connect to Owen Sound. Or you could take coach. Um, you could travel west again from Aurelia on the Old Mail Road. You could travel up one of the colonization roads. The first one that covered a good portion of Gray County was called the Garifraxa. It still exists today and it's known as Highway 6 today. And shortly after the Garifraxa was completed, the Toronto Sydenham Road or Highway 10, as we now know it, was another major road that connected uh, Gray County to the outside world. So these were called colonization roads? They were, they were. And it, it's, it was a very straightforward process um, in terms of the rationale for these roads. These roads were created to open up or provide access to newly opened land for settlement. So the real reason for existing was just to get that land settled. The Garifraxa was the first one, as I said, um, that connected Gray County. And it went from Guelph to Owen Sound, still does today. Uh, and it's a fairly straight line. It was, uh, it was carved right through the rock to make a nice straight line from Guelph North. And Stephanie, presumably there were colonization roads that kind of went out through Ontario a little bit, right? Absolutely. Colonization roads were not unique to Gray County. Uh, they were something that was put in place whenever a new area was opened up for non-Indigenous settlement. So they do all of this work to travel here. What was the win? What was the gem of Gray County for all of these people to go through all of those hardships to get here? Well, in some places in Gray County, you could, if you met all of the conditions, get free land, 
50 acres of it. If you could clear a third of the 50 acres, which is about 16 and two thirds acres within the first five years of settlement. To put it in modern context, one soccer field is about an acre and a half. So you would have to, um, you'd have, you'd get an equivalent of 30, almost 38 soccer fields if you could clear a third of it in the first five years. So, so 12 soccer fields <laughs> and you would own land. For many of these people, particularly those who came directly from Europe, the possibility of actually owning property in their home country was not something that would ever have been able to attain. So being able to own your own land that no one could take from you, that nobody could push you off of, was an enormous incentive for people to come. There was land also in Gray County that was sold, um, but generally the cost in this period, the 1840s and 50s, was quite reasonable. And so there was an enormous opportunity to become a free landholder. You did need also to build a road past your section of um, your designated sec section. That's how the roads were created. So it would be surveyed and then you'd be responsible for clearing or for creating a road on that section. And you need to build a home. You, what they didn't want was to have uh, absentee owners. So you needed to actually live on the property that you claimed. Right. When I think of the, our log cabin in Morriston Heritage Village, it's, it's pretty nice. I am assuming that as pioneers came up in this direction, they probably didn't come with a lot of stuff, a lot of tools, you know, a lot of supplies. I can't imagine that what they were doing when they first found their plot of land was to build something super, super fancy. Absolutely not. Um, as I said earlier, most of them don't have a ton of experience in building houses in any case, but really you need to start clearing the land almost immediately because you got to grow food to survive. So initially houses, and I'm using the term extremely loosely, they're more like shanties or shacks are thrown up to provide you for, with protection from the worst elements. These often did not have proper roofs. They had boughs of spruce, for example, uh, that provided a roof. And then uh, the floor would also just be a dirt floor. The purpose of it was simply to provide you with shelter. And then you could focus on clearing some land so that you could plant um, some crops and then have a harvest. Later on, uh, one of the things the pioneers did very well was they had a lot of communal efforts for things. So they had communal efforts for barn building, which most people know about because that continued well into the 20th century. But they would also have building bees to build a more stable kind of housing. Right, like barn bees and building bees. Exactly, exactly. So you come, you build, at first, what will be your shack? And then I presume you're going to do uh, some kind of fencing around uh, your, your cabin. Uh, but I notice in our heritage village, there, there are a couple of different kinds of fences. Yes, one of the earliest fences. And in Morston, we have it confined really to the log cabin section is the snake rail fence. Uh, you can see how with its zigzag pattern, it naturally got the moniker snake rail. Uh, it's made of rails from the trees that you've cut down. And the beauty of it is that you don't need any nails. You, it is simply stacking rails on top of each other in a zigzag pattern to create a fence. You want to do this because you want to protect the crops that you've just planted from deer, for example, who might just wander through your property and eat everything you just planted. There's still examples of snake rail fences throughout Gray County. Um, there's a marvelous section of snake rail fencing up at Ben Allen. Uh, it, it was a very easy, practical type of fencing to put up when you're in a hurry and you don't have a lot of resources. 
Well, and speaking of food, I guess gardening, clearing an area around your cabin to get that garden started must have been pretty uh, important to get going. Absolutely. Uh, Certainly the men of the family tended to focus on fields of hay and uh, wheat larger products like that, the garden for the family's survival tends to be the domain of the woman of the house. And that gets started as quickly as she can. It'll be in the dooryard so she can keep an eye on it so that she can go out and grab what she needs whenever she needs it. And she doesn't have to go over um, to a far away field. In these early years, the important thing that you need to do when you're planting your vegetable garden is think about the longevity of the produce. Is it something that's going to spoil easily or spoil quickly? Because if it is, you're not going to want it. Right. So what they planted tended to be things that you could either dry, you could store in cold storage, or that you could pickle. So things like beets, cabbage, corn, peas, beans, potatoes, turnips, those were common things for people to plant in their gardens in those years. Not fancy, but it fills you up, gives you good energy, and it will keep throughout the long winter. Now we can actually talk about a more settled life for pioneers, and this is the log cabin as we see it today in Morrison Heritage Village little bit different than those first early shacks. Absolutely. Uh, The log cabin is uh, appointed to 1853 and it is rather breathtaking how quickly the pioneers arrived in Gray County, cleared forests and built more stable homes within, you know, about 10 years. They go from zero to this. So it's pretty impressive. And our log cabin is made from wood, from timbers that were salvaged from a log cabin in Owen Sound on 8th Street across from um, the Owen Sound. There's a water reservoir on 8th Street just past 9th Avenue. And so the wood came from there in the late 1960s and was reconstituted into the log cabin that we see today. Right. One of the questions we often get asked is, did this log cabin ever, was it ever lived in as it is? And really the answer is no, correct? Absolutely. Uh, As I say, this is a replica log cabin and it is, this one in particular is especially fancy, even for 1853. You'll notice there's windows with numerous panes of glass, which is very, very expensive at that time. The roof has shingles, it has an eaves trough. Um, There's wonderful limestone chinking between all of the logs. You can see that it is raised on a stone foundation and that there is a beautiful stone chimney on the north side. That is a pretty hefty looking chimney. I'm assuming that there must be a pretty beefy fireplace or a hearth in the interior of this cabin. As a matter of fact, there is. There it is. There it is. This cabinet or this fireplace is a typical fireplace uh, for the time period and one that certainly immigrants from the British Isles would have initially constructed had they had the means to do so because you build what you know. And in the British Isles, people frequently burned peat at that time. Peat is, it sounds weird, but it's kind of a mud and you can cut it out in bricks. It burns very, very well. It burns very hot and it throws heat very nicely. It does not, however, throw a lot of smoke. So the settlers, especially from the British Isles, would build a fireplace typical of what they might've seen or had in, in Britain. But they learned very quickly that, uh, A, we don't have a lot of peat in Gray County. And also the materials that they have to make fires here, specifically the wood, when you burn a wood fire, uh, it does tend to throw a lot of smoke 
it does not throw heat very well and you can see the back of the fireplace is is black here because of efforts of trying to build a really strong fire and it just scorched the back of the fireplace <laughs> Again, a typical experience, and that would have been exacerbated in the first years because you haven't had time to season wood, so you're, bur you're burning a lot of green wood, so your cabin is getting filled with smoke on a routine basis. Gosh, again, just so much learning for the pioneers when they first arrive. Now, this is, uh, these are different views of the inside of the cabin. There's not a lot of space in here, not a lot of rooms. How, how This cabin is not very large. What size would a typical family have been? Well, a typical family might have had, uh, you know, eight to 10 children. Most of, certainly not all of them are likely to survive to adulthood. Child mortality is very, very high during this time period. But you could expect that uh, the family would have eight to 10 children at any given time of various ages. The cabin itself is just one room. In the picture on the left, we have a nice view of the parents room with a bit of a privacy partition uh, with the children sleeping in the room on the right. There is also a loft. The loft is used for storage and in the summer months, you could sleep up there. Some families, that's where the children slept in the summer months. You wouldn't have the kids sleep up there in the wintertime because, again, that fireplace does not throw much heat right. and you will freeze quite literally if you sleep in the loft. So um, the space is very modest in the cabin, but it's modest because people don't just hang out in the cabin. First of all, there is no time to just hang out. There are jobs to be done in order to ensure the family's survival. And you don't have the leisure to just hang out in your bedroom and play a game or what have you. So people are working outside and either they're working in the fields or working in the gardens or even things that we might think are indoor chores, they would do outside if they could, like sewing or spinning, you would do that outside whenever you could. I imagine they were working pretty steadily just to maintain life. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the learning curve of pioneers was pretty steep, but it's very impressive at how many families persevered and how they ultimately succeeded. It's why so many of us are here now in the 21st century, because those pioneers were so resilient, were so adaptable, and worked so hard. And so pioneer life is not romantic, but it is a study in tenacity and determination in the face of enormous obstacles. Stephanie, this has been a fantastic conversation. As we wrap this up, what are two remaining thoughts that, that you would like to leave us with? Well, there are two thoughts that uh, really coming out of any kind of examination of pioneer experience in Gray County and in Ontario generally. As I mentioned, pioneers have to encounter and endure obstacles and challenges, the likes of which their life before coming here probably didn't give them a lot of preparation to deal with. And they nevertheless persevered and succeeded. The other big piece is that Gray County was not an empty land waiting with anxious hands for immigrants to come and chop down forests and create farms. There were people here who had very full lives and who were happy with who they were and how they were living. And they were displaced in order to create a space for pioneers to settle. Grey Roots sees upwards of 40,000 visitors every year. We're, we're so privileged to be able to host 
uh, that number of visitors. And Stephanie, I'm sure you would agree that it's our volunteers who really help bring the village to life. It absolutely is. Our buildings are staffed by volunteers and they are some of the most dedicated, friendly, and knowledgeable people that you will encounter. And they are dedicated to making sure that visitors have a great experience out in the village. Thanks very much everyone for listening in on our presentation on the log cabin. Feel free to come and visit Grey Roots Museum and Archives, and we hope to see you again really soon.